Welcome, everyone. Hello, hello, hello. So our next session is on fostering collaboration, and we are so fortunate enough to have the likes of Cartier, Microsoft, and LVMH all speaking. And it's going to be one of the last talks of what has been an incredible first day of change now. And uh, I hope you've all enjoyed learning, connecting, collaborating, networking, and, and getting inspired. This next session is certainly going to do all of that as well. My name is Joss Ford. I'm, I'm CEO and founder of Enviral. We're a communications agency and consultancy in the UK. And I'm going to be your host for the next 45 minutes or so. But before starting, we've all learned so much today. I thought we'd break up the last few sessions just by having a little bit of a pause and a reflect. Maybe a, a big, deep breath through the nose out through the mouth, maybe a little bit of a, a wiggle around. Are we all ready? Brilliant, let's do this. So I'm very pleased to announce that we have got a short fireside with Anushka Didier Monsor of Cartier. And over the next few minutes, we're going to be discussing the collaborations which exist in industries like the jewelry industry. Uh, whilst exploring Cartier's Watch and Jewelry Initiative 2030, which is based on the 10 principles of the UN Global Compact. Um, so, Anushka, in her position, is responsible for integrating sustainability in the Maison's long-term strategy. Heading Cartier's sustainability department, Anushka contributes to strengthen the Maison's ethical commitments, working towards transformation within the whole industry. And uh, she's leading some incredibly um, great initiatives, such as the Watch and Jewelry Initiative, which we'll explore later on. So, um, Anushka, welcome to the stage. So, you've been, you've been at Cartier now for a decade. Yes. <laughs> Can you summarize it for us? And um, okay. uh, you are now International Sustainability Director. So, tell us about the journey. Yes, uh, first of all, thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be with all of you here today. Mm -hmm. So, it's been 10 years already, time flies. Um, I joined Cartier in 2013. And before that, I worked in international law and philanthropy. I have a background in economics mm -hmm. and international law. Uh, I was very lucky to grow up in a multicultural environment, grow up in different countries, and I've always been, um, I've also had the desire to contribute, uh, to have a more meaningful world. So at Cartier, I have this unique opportunity to have impact, uh, guided by my personal values, uh, in the very fast-paced environment of the private sector. So what do I do exactly? I lead the international sustainability team. Uh, I have a small but amazing team, full of energy, I'm mm -hmm. so lucky. And we work on all the social and environmental impacts that we have uh, as a company, so in our activities as a business. We report to an international uh, executive uh, committee member. And we're also very lucky because our CEO is extremely committed and visionary mm -hmm. on these topics. And he does drive as well the sustainability agenda, which makes a big difference, I think. Um, and uh, we've been working on all the impacts, and I have to say that in the last 10 years, uh, I do see a few changes in sustainability that okay. have evolved. I think as a business, we have an increased responsibility uh, to uh, act facing global challenges, uh, acting in planetary boundaries, and I think we're also expected to act on more and more topics, uh, biodiversity being, uh, you know, quite new uh, on our agenda as a company. And also, I think we have to collaborate more and more, both externally, and we're going to discuss this, but yeah. also in internally, we have to work with all the different functions and our employees and all our colleagues to really manage to achieve our uh, commitments. We have to work together. Mm. Well, this session is all about fostering <laughs> collaboration. So, I mean, you're in such a complex industry. Yes. Um, driving collaboration must be such an important part of your role and, and the whole company's. Um, I, I guess, what is your vision for being a responsible leader? Um, and, uh, I mean, how important is collaboration? Collaboration is key. Uh, we are a leading jewelry luxury maison, uh, and as such, we have a big capacity to influence. And with this uh, responsibility, uh, well, power comes the responsibility to be uh, exemplary and also to drive change in our industry. Uh, 
sustainability has been anchored in Cartier's DNA forever. Uh, we have some creations that are passed down from a generation to another. Uh, and uh, they are timeless, both in design and physically. They're eternally repairable. And they contribute as well to the preservation of traditional and uh, um, uh, local craftsmanship. And we have a localized production too in France, Switzerland, and Italy. Oh, tell, tell us a little bit more about that. About the manufacturing yeah. sites? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, uh, well, you know, watchmaking in Switzerland uh, is, uh, is traditional there, and we have the jewelry branch as well that is there, and, uh, and in France as well, and in Italy. So we have an amazing new manufacturing site in Turin that has solar panels, uh, wow. yes, that we just uh, launched. So it's uh, amazing as well to see how in our operations we can really uh, implement what we're trying to do in our supply chain too. So if I go back a little bit, uh, we had uh, created a dedicated department on sustainability 18 years ago. And from the start, so in 2005, we had a collaboration because we also co-founded the Responsible Jewelry Council, the RJC, that uh, sets responsible uh, standards in the uh, jewelry and watchmaking supply chain on gold, diamonds, platinum group metals, amongst uh, other materials. And our commitments are implemented all through uh, the steps of our operations. So we mentioned uh, uh, our manufacturing sites, but also we uh, look at how we buy, of course, uh, where our raw materials come from, how they're transformed, and how we carry our day-to-day -day operations in our boutiques, our offices, and our manufacturing sites. It also goes further, how we contribute uh, to bring the industry together. Today, we do act with a renewed sense of urgency when we see the global challenges that we must uh, contribute to solve. Um, and this is why we're accelerating our actions. Uh, we're implementing our science-based climate targets. Uh, we're also working to protect and respect the people uh, that bring to life our creations near or far. And this is also why uh, we bring the industry together through collaboration, such as the Watch and Jewelry Initiative 2030 that you mentioned. Uh, it's key for us to keep in mind some principles as well. We want to make sure we act as a leader by example. We want to make sure we consider all the impacts uh, long term when we take our uh, decisions. We want to avoid uh, disengagement. And finally, we also don't want to think in motion. That's a big principle we have. We don't have the luxury to wait to have all the answers. So we want to build both our knowledge and our concrete actions together. I, I mean, you, you mentioned a little bit about your supply chain there, and we've heard a lot about transparency throughout um, yes. today, and it's obviously yeah. a big area of focus for all corporates. Um, do you see almost a, a cultural shift happening? A and um, is business as usual changing, or is it you know, just pretty on the front of people's websites? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I do believe uh, business as usual is changing and that we're shifting from a very control and uh, you know, audit compliance approach with our suppliers mm. to a more of a collaborative partnership towards a common goal. Um, we have been collaborating for many years now with our suppliers, but also with our peers, our competitors uh, and other stakeholders. We do think that sustainability is a pre-competitive matter and that we have to work together. Uh, I already mentioned the RJC, the Responsible Jury Council in 2005. We went from 14 founding members to more than 1,600 members today. So that was quite successful. We also... In, in what kind of time frame? Well, from 2005 to, I would say, maybe 2020 to reach oh. 1,600 members. Um, that, we also that just sees that, yeah. that change happening. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and uh, more recently, we founded working groups on colored gemstones with our competitors to improve the colored gemstone industry uh, by providing some tools, uh, for responsible tools for suppliers, uh, research and trainings. And another example I can, I can share is uh, the Swiss Better Gold, which is a public-private partnership uh, where I sit at the board. And uh, it's a great opportunity to help create and support responsible small-scale mines, artisanal and small-scale mines, um, towards better practices. And here, through this partnership, we were able to really help the small actors of the gold supply chain to have uh, social and environmental projects implemented. And the first project we financed uh, managed to bring electricity to the mine uh, and the surrounding village, which helped the mine as well drop its carbon emissions by 62%. Uh, so we've been having a lot of uh, great collaborations that were quite specific in topic in our supply chain. 
but we did see the need to go further uh, and add a layer uh, that is more transversal, uh, uh, to have a coordination of different topics, to be able to align on tools and methodologies. We all have the same uh, challenges. Uh, and this is one of the rationals why we created the Watch and Jewelry Initiative, to make sure as well that we could uh, embark the smaller actors that often lack resources uh, on this journey collectively. Mm, it makes a lot of sense. And uh, I guess there's that scale of being able to look at things holistically as yes. well, which is rather than big, big brand over here and small bespoke exactly. uh, parts of the supply chain down here. And, and you've mentioned the, um, the, the Watch and Jewelry Initiative 2030 in a little bit of detail, but I'd love to kind of get a little bit more depth on that and maybe some kind of, I guess, case studies on how it's currently being practiced. Yes. So in the last years, we've seen that there was really a need to accelerate our sustainability actions uh, because the world's most critical problems need uh, you know, uh, collective uh, action. And this is why in uh, April 2022, uh, driven by our company CEOs, which is very important, uh, we launched the Watch and Jewelry Initiative 2030. It is the first time in the history that an initiative brings together the watch and the jewelry brands together uh, across the, the world. Mm. Uh, we have 37 members already, uh, which is uh, pretty impressive. And our wish is to unite all these actors uh, around a common set of uh, sustainability goals to transform the industry in a, in a systemic way. Um, by joining forces, we have the objective to accelerate our actions, but as well to maximize our impacts and also to unlock new opportunities that we can only reach collectively to transform our industry. Uh, we have been uh, accelerating, especially since uh, July 2022, when we had the nomination of uh, Iris van der Wicken as our executive director. She's been doing an amazing job in bringing us together to work. Um, so the, from the start, we had some key principles in mind. I think the first one uh, was that we wanted initiatives that was CEO driven, because you can only reach uh, transformation through transversal and uh, you know, systemic uh, change. Yeah. So you need to have your CEO that is on board and actually a driver uh, if you want to have the impact that is needed. Otherwise, it kind of feels like a side of desk exercise by exactly. a department over here. Exactly. We all know that we are switching not towards a sustainability strategy anymore, but just integrating sustainability in the business strategy, which is how you make the difference. We also wanted during this, uh, this first start, uh, when we thought about the initiative, to have um, an inclusive and open uh, initiative, open to all brands from geographies and sizes, uh, because we need all sizes. And we wanted to be data-driven, to show progress as well, internally, but also collectively as an initiative. And finally, we did not want to reinvent anything, so we wanted to take into account existing frameworks, such as the SBTI on climate, uh, but also go further uh, to integrate newer areas of focus, such as biodiversity. We know that we don't have all the tools that have been uh, shared and aligned yet, but we know we need to accelerate, and our industry uh, is, uh, needs the data as well, because there is, it's missing to apply some of the tools that we have on biodiversity. Um, so that's the, the key principles. Uh, we have three big goals. Uh, you won't be surprised. Uh, members, when they join, have to commit to three goals and underlining as well commitments to make sure they start their journey towards reaching these big goals. The first one is uh, around uh, climate resilience. Uh, the members have to, of course, reduce their carbon emissions uh, in line with the 1.5 uh, degree trajectory. Uh, this is where I think we will have a, a great collaboration because we all struggle with our scope three. At uh, Cartier, it represents 99% uh, of our carbon footprint, but we still need to collect some data to refine the data to really understand where our levers are. Uh, so that's the big goal, uh, first one. The second one is on preserving resources. And here, members, when they join, they commit to a map their biodiversity and water impacts using a science-based credible framework. So we're using the SBTN, and they've just launched our guidelines, the guidance. Um, and this here will be key uh, to collect the data all along the value chain to, to use the tools like the GPS uh, tool. And the, finally, the last goal we have is around fostering inclusiveness and want to yeah. make sure that we ensure responsible and inclusive uh, value chains. 
we've had some concrete actions that I can share as well uh, to conclude, because uh, I see time is uh, already <laughs> off. Uh, we've been uh, working on a best-in-class governance uh, following a wide stakeholder uh, consultation. We have a, almost a full board uh, as of this month. We have nine board members. We uh, created two fundamental partnerships, one with the UN Global Compact, one with UN Women. We have great experts on climate, human rights, and biodiversity that are working with us. So we have the Boston Consulting Group, we have Business uh, for Social Responsibility, and the Biodiversity Consultancy. Uh, and we've launched two pilots uh, a few months ago, uh, one on ESG data uh, and uh, uh, building a framework to measure, track, uh, progress, and also report as an initiative on the, on the goals we have set for ourselves, and also to help members prepare for the evolving uh, regulatory landscape that we all uh, see is coming. Um, so maybe to conclude, I would say that what we've uh, created as an industry can be replicated to others, yeah. uh, because we know now that businesses uh, must take the lead, mm. uh, and that the world's most critical problems um, go further than the capacity of only one organization's skills, leadership, or resources. So in reality, sustainability is a collective uh, yeah. journey. Well, it, it sounds like you're an exceptionally busy person, and it's, um, it's great to hear some of the things that you've been doing, and I'd love to chat for another 30 minutes, um, but we have another uh, globally recognizable brand. Yes. We've got Microsoft um, uh, coming on stage now, talking about how they're fostering collaboration. So um, please uh, Thank you. give a hand. Thank you very Alicia. much. Thank you so much. Thank you. So um, in the next panel, we'll be exploring how Microsoft, who, let's be honest, will have affected every single person in this room in some way, if you know or not, uh, today. We're going to see how they're leveraging relationships with positive impact entrepreneurs to drive both their ESG goals forward as well as their customers. So we'll be exploring Microsoft's global social entrepreneurship program with Jean-Philippe of Microsoft and Sarah from Voiceit. Um, and a little bit about both of the speakers, as you can see on stage here, are. Um, uh, that Jean-Philippe Courtois is Executive Vice President and President of National Transformation Partnerships at Microsoft. And his focus is on transforming national economies by helping to create sustainable and inclusive growth through global digital transformation. And um, a bit like Anushka, Jean-Philippe is an exceptionally busy person and he spends much of his time um, outside of working with Microsoft uh, with the Live for Good Foundation, which he co-founded with his family back in 2015, and as executive sponsor of the Entrepreneurship for Positive Impact program, Jean-Philippe helps support social entrepreneurs to scale their impact through Microsoft's technology, expertise, visibility, and ecosystem. And we'll also be uh, joined by uh, Sarah from Voiceit. So Voiceit is a brilliant organization um, which has been linked to the Entrepreneurship for Positive Impact program. And Sarah is co-founder of Voiceit, uh, she leads business development and partnerships in the US and is driving real inclusive social change uh, by providing an AI speech assistant for people with speech disabilities, disorders, and impairments. O honestly, um, go into your notes, bookmark voice it, go and watch some of the videos on their website. Um, it, it's just amazing to see how they're transforming lives for better. So um, Jean-Philippe and Sarah, please come onto the stage. Well, welcome. Hello. Thank you. Hello. John Philippe, let's start with you. Um, how long have you been at Microsoft? Wow, 39 years. <laughs> you can see it, right? 39 years, that is a long time. Yes. Um, how exciting is it to be here in 2023, <laughs> seeing, I guess, social entrepreneurship, a momentum like we've never really seen before? I think it's an amazing moment. It's an amazing moment personally because of what drives my life and you summarize actually in a pretty extensively what I do both at Microsoft where I, I try to sponsor initiate partnership with impact entrepreneurs like Sarah, Voice, Voice Seat and many others we could see in, in change now mm. 
And also doing the same with my foundation and seeing, I think, an inflection point where the corporate world, I believe, is starting to move forward in a significant way. That's my deep belief. I'm an optimist. Mm -hmm. And where you see the different stakeholders, public services, public sector, investors, impact funds, and youth, super important, I'll come back to that. Very much important. Work. Who are all driving and striving to create innovative solutions to meet the needs of the people on the planet. So, so tell us about Microsoft's Entrepreneurship for Positive Impact program. Like, wh why did you start it? Yeah. And what are some of the results that you've seen? So first of all, I think, uh, as I just said, Josh, I think I see some positive signals happening in the world. You know, look at the US. Actually, the US is investing tons of money with US Inflex Inflation Reduction Act, like $370 billion to create a green economy in the US. There are a lot of subsidies from solar to nuclear fission to a lot of new businesses happening. Europe, of course, there's like another 600 billion euros for the EU you know, Green Deal. Uh, and the corporate world is going through an inflection point, which is moving from CSR and philanthropy, which I love, by the way, into ESG. And ESG is a very fun game. I'm sitting on the board of a couple of companies. ESG is actually about the way you embed at the core of your products, your supply chain, your design, manufacturing, people, workforce, subcontractors, the way you impact them positively, hopefully, or reduce your negative impacts across all the facets of the environment, social, and governance. So it means that at the board level, CEOs, board directors become liable for that. Yeah. And so we created this initiative a year ago at Change Now, actually it was announced here, <laughs> because we have the theory of change is the following. We believe, I deeply believe, there are two sets of change makers in the world who are doing something about the climate social change. One are social entrepreneurs. They've been around for 40 years, the Ashokas of the world and so on, amazing people who are mission-led, who create hybrid solutions but lack technology capacities often. And then you've got impact entrepreneurs like Sarah and others who are startups, tech-led, who have the passion as well for a mission. And what we've decided to do is to create a framework, a program where we've been onboarding now 860 of them across the globe, 64 countries. 48% of solutions are revolving around the E of environment with many different issues from water to biodiversity to waste management, everything, to the S of social governance. And the problem is really about four things, very briefly. One is about tech innovation. You know, I was actually amazed, I was of course going through the booth. There was a demo from a French global company called Equimetrics. They are using ChatGPT and or Azure OpenAI service to create a dialogue with a French citizen and any citizens, they're going to extend that to the world to demystify the thousands of pages of the IPCC report, which, as you know, is super dense, super technical that nobody reads usually. <laughs> and they made it so accessible, so easy for people to have a conversation, to get smarter and to truly understand what the issue is. So tech, tech innovation, two is about bringing community of change makers together and get them to connect and, and, and help each other. Three is leadership. We've been connecting our senior leaders as a coaching program. And four is about good market, because at the end of the day, this is not about philanthropy. It's about getting a lot of solutions out of the market so that all our large customers, including our friends of Cartier and any others, can have real cloud AI-led solutions to meet their ESG roadmap. So that's what it is in instant. And um, you just mentioned you sit on um, a couple of boards. Do you sleep? I do sleep. <laughs> I sleep well. Sounds like you're Even very busy. Even the rings person. actually monitor my sleep. <laughs> um, Sarah, over to you. I'd love to know a little bit more about um, Voice It's mission, um, and you know maybe um, talk about how the journey started with with Microsoft. Yeah, of course. First of all, I do have to say I'm so honored to be on this stage and so inspired to be part of this event, and grateful to be able to be part of the Microsoft Entrepreneurship. Uh, for Positive Impact program, which has been so meaningful for our company and for so many others. So I just want to thank you personally for that. So Voice It, uh, we are a Israel-based startup. Uh, we've built voice AI for people with speech and motor disabilities. Basically speech recognition 
for people with non-standard speech. Voiceit, like many startups, uh, really per started from a personal experience and continues to have personal resonance for our founding team and our core team. In my case, it was uh, my grandmother. She was diagnosed early onset Parkinson's disease, so age 40. And so by the time that I was born, she had lost most of her motor capabilities, but more than anything, it was her speech that was impacted. And you know, even as a young child, I felt her frustration because it was difficult for her to communicate even basic human needs, like I'm thirsty or it's cold. So, and of course, that affected her ability to build a relationship with my brothers and me. So that was our kind of personal experiences in our families that were our inspiration to develop VoiceIt. So a voice AI speech recognition that can learn a person's way of speaking and then translate for them in real time, enabling them to connect and communicate with others by voice. Now, I'd have to say that when we started the company, it was before the, really a lot of the buzzwords around voice AI or even machine learning or speech recognition in its early days. And um, you know, as we were kind of discussing before, a lot of startups are about timing. And we're now at a point where AI generally, but specifically conversational AI, where voice is increasingly, or language is increasingly the way that we interact with our technologies, suddenly, we're right in this, um, in this intersection where how can we ensure that cutting edge technologies are accessible to all consumers, all customers, and especially the most vulnerable, especially those who can benefit from it the most. And um, so that's the, the journey that we're on. And as we'll talk about today, I think we, um, we as a startup can't do it without corporate partnerships. Um, and um, yeah, we'd love to, I'd love to kind of talk more about but how we've got here. Was, was there like a moment that you, you kind of did an application phase and was there an email and you were like, oh my God, we've got it? <laughs> yeah, well, our first interaction with Microsoft, um, we won a, a, a grant. So we took a creative combination, sort of a creative approach to funding where we tried to combine government grants and corporate cash prize competitions with investment. Um, in order to build our technology. And so we won a competition that Microsoft ran called AI for Good. Um, and in parallel, received investment from Microsoft's uh, investment fund called uh, the M12. And um, with this support, um, we were able to collect um, audio data, which if any machine learning company or, or entrepreneur founder in the room knows, it's a problem or a challenge for all machine learning companies. So we're able to get this support through a Microsoft collaboration to collect initial audio data in order to build our next generation technology. And as part of this prize as well, we have the opportunity, and I'm not sure if we talked about this, we had the opportunity in, um, in Seattle, in Redmond, Washington, to meet um, Mr. Satya Nadella, CEO of Microsoft, um, which is a really unique experience, but had the chance to, to see and experience what it's like for leadership at the top to be not just talk about let's help the start, let's help you know social impact people, you know, but really to show commitment to making this happen in whatever direction it takes. And that's been truly meaningful. And as we'll talk about, there's a lot of ways that we've been able to do that um, in you know, creative directions and where collaborations and partnerships are most meaningful. So, so why, why should major enterprises you know, collaborate with uh, positive impact entrepreneurs? Like, what do you kind of get from it? I think there's a lot to gain from that. Uh, I, I will just mention a couple of huge opportunities. I mean, first of all, as I said before, it's about finding real solutions. I was talking to Sarah about the fact that their solution initially was targeted to really some unique set of disabilities. And now, with the pearl of generative AI, you can be inclusive of any kind of people who are shy, who don't talk <laughs> in the same way than others and you can enable them to participate. That's a great example of the S of social in a company. Now, give me some example, because I think it's very practical. I was talking to the CEO of Biodiversity, B and O Diversity. What do they do? They use bees, like a fleet of drones, but real bees, okay, it's not drones. Yeah. 
to basically fly across a landscape and be able to collect pollens and then with all those biomarkers analyze and index the biodiversity of the landscape. And what they do, they help out a bunch of companies like Danone and others to have a real biodiversity strategy because you get, you know what, for all the ESG stuff we talk about all the time, it's about data. Mm. You need to have data. <laughs> you better have data, data that are reliable, transparent, trustable. And so that's something pretty unique where you can find solutions. Let me give you another example. It's a French company expanding now to Europe, Viscab. What do they do? They've been able to get deep into construction materials. Construction accounts for 10% of CO2 emissions in the world. It's huge. And the biggest part of that is the materials you use when you build the place. Because you can do some great work in terms of energy efficiencies as you operate, but if you, sorry, if you screw up with materials, you're kind of dead in terms of CO2 emissions. So they work on that with depths in terms of data analytics and so on to actually enable promoters of very new projects to be with the right materials in the first place, to cut down their CO2 emissions roadmap. I could go on and on. So you've got Ecovadis, a French global company, the lead, one of the leading actually uh, global ESG business sustainability ratings. They are using Microsoft Data and AI platform to enable that, to be able again to trace that and connect into our cloud for sustainability. So that's the first thing is getting real solutions for like the, the Cartier executive we had on stage and all the sustainability ESG officials of the company because they need a real solution. It's not just big statements on stage. It's about what we do yeah. every year to cut down. And the second thing to me, which I think is huge, I believe in, in such because of my life probably as well, is what you get in return connected with entrepreneurs like Sarah and others, right? I mean, you, you could feel it, I hope, from the, state, from, uh, from the audience as well. You get so much positive vibes. <laughs> it's so inspiring. Always, number one, about the why they do what they do, okay? It's not to be famous and rich, okay? It's actually to have a real impact in the world. And in the process, they can make money, that's okay. But as long as they stay very focused on their purpose and the mission they have. So as we embark, including Microsoft, I've put together a leadership program where I've connected 100 of our senior leaders in the companies that we have trained, and they become the coach of the CEOs of those entrepreneurs globally, one-to-one -one relationship, deep. The feedback I'm collecting for those people, because the reality, they are learning more than what they're going <laughs> to, they're going to, exactly, they're going to help the entrepreneurs, ecosystem, Microsoft, accessing the market and so on, but they, they get so much internal transformation about yeah. the impact they can have in their jobs to achieve a good outcome, that, that is transformative for a company. So I, I do believe that for those two reasons, that corporate connection, if, if it's well done with those positive impact entrepreneurs, can make a big change actually in the corporate world as well. And, and, and you mentioned something there that, that kind of sparked something with me. The, the S in ESG, especially, you know, not necessarily this, this conference, but when you're scrolling online, it's very easy for the E to stand out. I mean, is that changing in corporates? Is, is business as usual changing when it comes to social? Well, first of all, thanks for letting me know what S stands for. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, when I'm thinking of you know collaboration in um, and you know where um, you know those letters, I think in in a corporate um, environment, you know there's a lot of things that clearly startups can do, and clearly things that we just cannot ever do. Um, and the same in in reverse um, in terms of what these sort of um, uh, the, the beginnings of innovation within a corporate environment um, and how fast it can naturally move and so on. Um, so that's, that's sort of clear and I think there, it's also what's now pretty famous, um, the concept that with um, AI now and where it is now, you can have a billion dollar company with like one person or two people. Um, I would argue that um, we'll always need big companies, we'll always, we will need organizations as humans. Yeah. Um, but you know, when I think of collaboration within um, within corporates and with startups, um, it's a lot more than just a sale or an acquisition, which are great, by the way. Um, <laughs> so a sale and acquisition are great, but I think it's an illusion that those are the only things that are possible when we think about corporate partnerships. 
Um, I'd like to give an, like an example um, with um, through our programs and, and what we're doing with Microsoft from the very beginning, um, and now our, our, our partnership goes you know a, a few years already. But from the very beginning, um, the support that we received from the individuals within um, the organization has been more me equally meaningful or even more meaningful, I would say, than any sort of sale could be. Um, as founders, this, the kind of mentorship that comes from, um, that, that is possible through the expertise of, of, of executives in the different organizations from Microsoft and also from others, um, continues to be that the real um, that real driver, um, and I wish I, I could as as we were sitting here to come on the stage. I actually was thinking of of all of the mentors within Microsoft, and there's there's many, and so I couldn't mention any. But if you're at any of them, but if you're watching this, that has been um, I think the core of, of where our collaboration um, has been and that impact. And, and in the um, Microsoft Entrepreneurship for Positive Impact program, I mean. Are you looking for equal environmental and social entrepreneurs and, 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 and innovations? Well, to be honest, we are looking at all colors, again, of ESG. Because the reality is super granular. So even if you get into the social, you get into all the cognitive bias. You get into racial justice. You get into human rights. You get into accessibility, disability issues. You get into all the mental issues of the workplace that you hear about a lot, you know, through the pandemic and beyond the pandemic as well. So it's fascinating to see how we can find a lot of innovative solutions for those entrepreneurs who are making it much more practical for enterprise. They could be HR directors, they could be you know, heads of supply chains, they could be, depending on the business and the sector, you have an incredible variety of challenges you need to tackle, one industry and one customer at a time. So that's what we are trying to achieve. And I think we have a pretty good representation now. And it's also global. I love it because you've got such a different perspective from people in Korea or discussing, in Israel, in the US, in France, in Germany, in the Middle East. I mean, and, and they bring together that collective inclusion innovation, which I see is quite, quite powerful. And are you actively looking for more businesses and social entrepreneurs? Well, it's not about just having a massive number. <laughs> we really are trying to help and drive their positive impact. And the way we measure that is, uh, at the end of the day, as I said, it's about the way their solutions get spread with many more users, whether in a corporate world, some are tackling citizens, some are tackling patients in healthcare. It depends on the business model they have. So that's where we measure the impact, and we're actually very centered on the UN SDG goals, uh, particularly, I would say, on earning trust, on climate change, on human rights, and on skills and economic development. Those are four core tenets for Microsoft Mission, and we're really trying to do as good job as we can as a global uh, technology company to broaden our ecosystem impact and to achieve more in those four areas. There might be a few people in the audience who are you know, specifically looking to scale their idea. Um, Sarah, you have raised uh, you know, a, a good amount of money to start and kick off your journey. What kind of tips would you give positive impact entrepreneurs to raise finance to accelerate their idea? That's a hard question. <laughs> um, well, I mentioned we've taken a creative approach to fundraising um, because we sit in this um, difficult spot of um, uh, an imp social impact enterprise, uh, for-profit startup, um, but what is sometimes considered somewhat niche or less sexy topic sometimes of more vulnerable um, individuals and less mainstream market. So we really had to take this creative approach um, and so we combined um, applications to government grants and corporate uh, cash prize competitions and investment. Um, something that's n not always well known is um, Israel-based startups are eligible for European Commission funding. And um, so you, the European Commission is one of our greater supporters, great, um, largest supporters and funders which has enabled us to um, expand within Europe to support additional languages, and most of all, to build partnerships um, internationally with stakeholders that include corporate, but also nonprofits and disability organizations and healthcare institutions and academia that um, 
enables us to make sure that at the end of the day, we're not just building another cool technology, but really, um, really serving, really uh, addressing the needs of the people that we support, which are people um, with uh, people with disabilities. And I can imagine that there's a plethora of other amazing benefits from partnering with Microsoft, just even from a brand perspective. Yeah, absolutely. As I mentioned, there's so much more than funding. Um, I mentioned the mentorship, and I just I have to say it again because it's personally meaningful to me um, as um, a founder and um, and having that um, kind of support, as well as building out a business case, which I think again is something um, worth emphasizing. That you know, for those of us building impactful solutions, at the end of the day, we need to address the real needs of real customers mm -hmm. and working through that with corporate partners, with people who believe in our mission, but also believe in our business is, um, is really crucial. So Jean-Philippe, just to close off this session, um, if somebody did manage to get a partnership with you, what one final tip would you give that entrepreneur um, in entering the collaboration? I think to me, I mean, uh, always the critical question to impact entrepreneurs is the following. Tell me about the why you did, you started what you do, mm. and what is it you really want to achieve in the world? Mm. And that to me, capturing the reality of that story, the deep connection between the individual purpose of Sarah and Voice It, I guess you, was very real. I hope that you, you felt it the same way I felt it. And this is some, something that people cannot you know, manufacture, cannot be fake. And I think if you got that, that's a critical enabler of success, not the only one, of course. I mean, you can be passionate, you can be inspiring, you can be purpose-led, but at least you have clarity on your North Star, or the why and what is the impact you really want to have in the world, and then you can derive from that the business strategy the funding strategy, the products, the services, some free beneficiaries, some paid services, and you create a model that can grow from the economics you created to maximize the impact and not the other way around. So that's the tip I would give to the entrepreneur. And keep it nice and single-minded, so not trying to solve everything. <laughs> exactly. Um, well, that was full of so much brilliant information. Thank you so much. Um, if we can give a, a round of applause to Sarah and Jean-Philippe. Thank you so much. Thank you. So good. So the third and last part of today's session is with Alexandra Capelli of LVMH, Marie Falguera of Nona Source. Oh, here we go. You are here. Um, and the amazing Alice Odoir of Art of Change 21 to discuss how collaboration can be a source of creation, circularity, and therefore a powerful source for good. And um, yeah, please come and come and sit here. I'm going to sit in the pink chair. So, so I, I pulled the definition of collaboration online. And it says, collaboration is the process of two or more people, entities, or organizations working together to complete a task or to achieve a goal. Well, we have three people who are literally working week in, week out doing that, achieving lots of goals. So it's great to have you guys on, on stage. Um, I have a bio for you guys, so I'm going to read it. Why not? Um, we have Alex over here. Alex joined LVMH in 2006, where he works now as the Group Environment Deputy, Deputy Director. Um, he began his career in 1999 as senior consultant leading projects in communication and eco-design with the luxury and agro-food industries, and is an integral uh, part of LVMH's Life360 initiative. Um, Marie, hello. You are the co-founder and head of product at Nona Source, um, and Nona Source provide affordable, luxuri uh, luxurious dead stock fabrics and leathers from the most exclusive high-end luxury houses and famous designers. Um, and you've been working with LVMH, um, am I right here, for the last three years? Three years, perfect. And we have Alice. Hello, Alice. Um, Alice is the chairman and founder of Art of Change at 21. And Alice has been involved in sustainable development for 20 years. We're, we're clocking up some good numbers here in sustainable development uh, today. 
And um, yeah, you, you, you've got a passion for communicating the link between contemporary art and the environment to truly engage people um, with the sustainability movement. And I believe you guys have been working together for five years, is that right? Yeah. Wow, there we go. Um, well, Alex, let's start with you. Um, you've been working in this set space for a, for a long time. Um, before we talk about Lona's Source and Art of Change 21, I'd, I'd love to understand why collaboration is important to you uh, and ultimately um, give a little bit of insight on the uh, Life360 initiative. Yeah, yeah, quickly first, environment and sustainability is, is quite a long-standing commitment for LVMH and it all started 31 years ago now. I was not there at its time, but um, yeah, we have now a, a strategy called Life360. It's based upon four main pillars. The first one is circular creativity. It's all about eco-design and product. Second one is about traceability and transparency. So being able to trace all our strategic raw materials until the field, until the mine. And transparency is more about sharing some information at the product level with our customer. Then biodiversity, uh, we have some target on f achieving zero deforestation, on, on raw material certification, and also covering, uh, preserving, regenerating 5 million hectares by 2030. And the last pillar is climate. Everyone knows about climate now. Mm -hmm. And to achieve this ambitious target, we know that we rely on, on, on collaboration, on innovation. Without innovation or collaboration, very likely we won't be able to achieve these targets. And for us, it's may, it means mainly three main topics. The first one is to create new, circular, regenerative, innovative business. Uh, and Nona Source is a perfect one. It has been. Marie will talk more about Nona Source, but it, it, it's all about boosting, uh, scale up circularity within the fashion industry and also supporting young creation. Second topic, which is really key for us, is how we can, we can change the re representation of beauty, how we can make the link between nature and creativity. And to achieve this target, which will definitely help the luxury industry to, 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 to change the, present, the representation of beauty, we rely a lot on artists and, and, and creative people. And again, the collaboration uh, with Alice uh, and with artists is, is really key. Just very quickly, one illustration. Uh, thanks to Alice, we have met an artist called Taj Bistaker, a Dutch artist, uh, which is doing great piece of art uh, on all about deforestation and reforestation. Uh, and we also have a partnership with the Man and Biosphere Program at UNESCO. And we all met the three of us together, and we almost fell in love. Uh, yeah. And we are collaborating now for, with this artist for five years. And very quickly, the first collaboration was at the IUCN Summit in Marseille in 2020. And, and Taj made a piece of art called uh, Wither. It was a monumental tree with uh, leaves that switch on and off at the pace of deforestation in the Amazon Basin. So the idea is, was really to highlight and communicate on the rhythm of deforestation in the Amazon Basin to, to hold the visitors. Second collaboration was uh, at the last COP15 in Montreal with a piece of art called Econario. And again, it was a kind of monumental tree growing and growing at the pace, uh, no, at the, with the, depending the outcome, positive or negative, of the daily discussion at the COP15. So again, it was a visual way to, to communicate to visitors and to people. Uh, and last is the last point for us, for us, which is really key and relying a little bit less on creatives. It, it's also having some pure R&D project uh, on new innovative technologies, new innovative materials, and I will come back to that later. Thanks. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for that. And um, uh, Alice, I, I'm, I'm also a huge uh, advocate for, for making the sustainability narrative engaging and inspirational. Um, I, I think that seems like it's core to art. Of change, uh, but I'd love to understand the importance of collaboration w w with you, and specifically what the conclave is. Um, thank you. Uh, just a, a few words about me, because I collaborate with many, many people, with artists, with companies, with institutions. As founder and chair of a non-for-profit. I deal with the UN environment, COP climate. Uh, as a consultant, I will deal with companies also like LVMH. Uh, and also as curator, I will deal with cities, museums. So I have a, you know, I am used to collaborate with many, many different people. Um, you talk about the conclave. This is, you know, this is where Art of Change 21 was born. The conclave is something a bit special because 
if you know what a conclave is, is usually where you elect the new pope. And uh, my idea when I created Art of Change 21 was to gather social entrepreneurs, and, uh, artists, and young climate activists. The idea was to say, I want to do something new. And I, I'm sure that bringing together artists and activists and social entrepreneurs will be a very good way to imagine new campaigns, new ways of mobilize, mobilizing people. And this is, for instance, how Maskbook, one of our big projects, a participatory project at Art of Change 21 is born uh, with more than 200 events in the world now and about uh, 8,000 uh, participants. Mm. So um, I think this is cooperation in the way of making decisions, of brainstorming. And I think that you can use that even to create an NGO, and this is what I did. But now, uh, collaboration, as uh, you know, um, Alexander was talking about, um, is very interesting because I, I want to share a little anecdote about Taj okay. Bistaker uh, because when I put them together, the idea was also that LVMH would finance the, the artwork of Taj. Taj, when I said to Taj, hey, LVMH will be your sponsor, uh, Taj told me, stop. I want to check if there is no greenwashing behind that. I want to have a discussion and to have the proof that I would create an artwork talking about deforestation, which would not be sponsored by a company involved in this deforestation. And uh, thank you, Alexander and Hélène Valade, because, you know, it was a new, you know, the power has, has changed, you know. It was not the artist like, thank you, you give me money. But it was like, okay, Let's collaborate together, but based on common values. And uh, so Alexander had to prove that, OK, everything was OK. And then the collaboration could start. And uh, there is another example uh, named Jeremy Gobet, also with LVMH. He does a coral restoration as an artist, but he has invented a kind of lace which can help coral to, 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 to be restored. And um, the same, you know, we brought him in a biomimicry, uh, you know, um, fair. We made many different things. And I think that uh, environmentally engaged artists are not in museums or gallery, not only. They love to talk with scientists. They love to talk about innovation with companies because they want to share solutions. And they are kind of researchers, as well as you have researchers in your innovation department. Well, any artist in the audience knows that you have the power. And uh, you can ask for a due diligence process when working with big corporates. That's really interesting to know. Um, and Marie, you've been working together since 2020. Um, I'd love to know what the last three years has been like working um, with LVMH because it seems to me that the momentum and, and just the perspective of the circular economy is so different now to even just three years ago. Um, and I'd love to know what those early conversations were like with LVMH. Yes, yeah, sure. Um, I will just tell you first what is Nona Source, at what we do at Nona Source, and then explain you the, this momentum. Um, what we do, it's all about fabric rolls calls needed to make garments and uh, what we do is that we collect and resell all those um, production uh, overstocks from the LVMH um, luxury maison to professionals of fashion and design via our um, uh, digital platform so B2B platform um, okay we our ambition is to normalize the reuse of uh, dead stock fabrics existing resourcing and to be a key player of uh, circular economy in the fashion industry. And so it's two years ago that we opened uh, officially. 
And it was, it is true what you said about the momentum. It was not that mature as it is today, but all the pieces of the puzzle were already there. Uh, on the one side, I can say um, there were so many independent designers or small brands struggling to get access to high quality fabrics at affordable prices in a small quantity, because these uh, this are the rules of, uh, of the fashion uh, industry. And on the other side, there were plenty of sleeping rolls, we call them the sleeping beauties, unused in warehouses and just there. And beside that, there is a, I would say the trend of starting an increasing pressure around the waste um, reduction issue and emergency. So in this context, of course, we had a, a card to play. And, um, and we, for the beginning, we always position ourselves as an um, uh, impact-driven and collaborative initiative, uh, as well as a problem solver. This is key. So the first key to convince LVMH group to materialize our ID was to, um, to underline the value of those desktop and consequently their great resale potential, first step. The second step was to onboard, onboard all the LVMH maison because the uh, desktop are coming from their warehouses. So we had to, um, to show them um, the, the great story, the great second life they could have, and they could join and participate to circular economy. And it's a question, it's all about transmission, because a fabric is uh, as a story, it's not just a, a fabric roll sleeping, it's an um, um, addition of savoir-faire selected by a great uh, DA in the maison. Uh, and so it's, uh, of course, um, it's a treasure for, for designer. So we, we convinced the Maison, that we, we received a great um, welcome in, uh, in the Maison, and we start working on setting new processes, um, um, working on traceability, on uh, data collect, and it was a huge work, um, and many, many departments were involved. It looks simple like that, it's not only purchasing roles. We involved the um, CSR team, but as well purchase department, logistic, and all this, and it was really a collective work. So I would say that this first collaboration with LVMH and the Maison made uh, what we are today at Nona Source. And uh, I can say it's a, it's a mix of personal values, of, um, of collective intelligence, and uh, corporate commitment. This is very important. And right. the third and maybe main collaboration is with our customer, all the design um, community, I would say. It's, uh, we made all this for them, so we build a um, tailored solution for them. Uh, basically, in a few clicks, when they go on the platform Nona Source, they can find the fabric they want, they need, uh, and they very important for us to help them because we know that eco-conception um, using existing fabrics is a, a constraint. Um, and so <clears throat> we have to share the most information with a great picture, high digitalization level. And for them, it's, uh, it's so easy that they can access to those beautiful fabrics and the price is very affordable. It was uh, something we wanted to, to support because we, Nona Source is, uh, first of all, a support of, um, of circular economy and new business model based on uh, sustainable sourcing. So this is what we do. <laughs> so there's a lot in there, which is amazing. <laughs> it is. Today, we collaborate with uh, 12 maisons of the group LVMH. So you know the name of uh, yes. them, very famous. And as well, we've, we have now uh, 1,500 customers. Wow. So this is amazing. And uh, I can say they are all players of the change, and their success is our success. So, so I'm, I'm a big believer, like you are, of imagination. If we can imagine a future, maybe we can create that future. Uh, you, um, Alex, talked about some incredible, um, uh, interesting, creative ideas that you guys have collaborated on. Um, do you think that collaboration can inspire imagination in a corporate space? And maybe that's an open question to both of you. I realize I didn't present out of change on one. They did LVMH and Nona. Just a few words about yes, of course. maybe out of change on one. Uh, we promote the role of the artist in the ecologic transition, ecological transition. We bring them to COP climate, we organize exhibitions, and we create prizes. And uh, we are supported by uh, a maison by LVMH, which is Ruinard. 
and uh, we support environmentally engaged artists or eco-conscious artists, no matter how you call them. But we also push a lot eco-design, and this is a very strong common point between together, because we think that all the artists, no matter if they are green or not in their message, they want to reduce the impact of their practice. So we have launched with Renard the first eco-design art prize. And uh, so we do many things, not only to promote the content and the imagination of a, what could be a post-carbon world, but also how can we implement it as an artist in my own practice, okay, yeah. uh, you know, and um, I think the two are very important. But about imagination, uh, I think that the artists are maybe the best positioned to challenge the current mindset, to reverse it. If you take Thomas Saraceno with this Irosin project, it's a kind of new ideas of transportation. It, use, it uses neither oil nor solar power. He says, no, solar power, no, we'll not take that. There are rare metals in it. So we are all thinking, like, let's jump from oil to, to solar energy. And this artist says, no, let's go further, just with the sun and the jet stream. So for us, you know, it's like, oh, it's very far. And then you have another artist named Arun Mirza. He uses solar panels in his works. And, but he says, hey guys, you know, solar energy will, will bring a new civilization. What will be our culture? Will we have rituals? Uh, maybe if we see the sun, we will have a kind of gratitude if this sun is now sensual as a provider of energy. And these things are about an anthropological, on an anthropological way, what could be a new sort of civilization. So imagination is to think about the future, but also the society, but on a very concrete way. Uh, if you take new materials such as kombucha, mycelium, algae, you know, and even bioluminescence, I can, I know so many artists working on that. They are like the best researchers on that today and we know and it's also a common point that many you know companies are also, are also looking for alternative to the leather and new that type of so i think there is a strong connection and if you if when you leave you go behind and you see the ruinard uh, space at the at the at the lvmh wet and sea space you will see a kind of tree right here mm. you know it's a nils yudo um, uh, tree, but, and this is new, an artwork can provide ecological services. It's in the middle of the vineyard, but it provides biodiversity. It, it, it accelerates biodiversity uh, in the vineyard. So you can also think about art uh, in your CSR, in your sustainability strategy. Artists can, you know, challenge you, but also strongly help you. Yeah. It's, it's, it's definitely a, a tool within a business toolkit to, to think differently and think against the grain. Um, Alex, just because we're, we're running short on time, um, I'm interested to know, is there a secret source to a long-lasting collaboration? I'll be short because, yes, it's, it's over now. <laughs> we are in Paris, so I would say it's almost the same ingredients as a very loving couple. You, know, you need a bit of passion. You need a long-standing commitment to create confidence. You need mutual benefits, and of course, you need to be demanding, but also support each other in difficult times, you know? That's it. And you're married for a very long time. Yeah, almost 22 years. <laughs> <laughs> and um, Marie and Alice, um, is there any final remarks for small brands or, or artists who are looking to collaborate with large, you know, especially reputational brands? Have you got any kind of thoughts or, or remarks on that? What I can say about that is um, what is significant in the new circular model in fashion uh, architecture is uh, the interdependence of um, say core um, savoir-faire like manufacturing and the new services uh, like uh, sorting, traceability, uh, recycling, or all those new channels. 
and uh, so this is new and very specific and this um, this creates bridges and synergy uh, opportunities especially uh, drive by innovation mm. so i really believe in that and um, we see we can see today more and more brands and groups that are partnering with startups innovative startup um, to, to to achieve this uh, this purpose and so this is uh, very positive because we only need to um, to addition uh, to make an addition with all our skills and it's a new uh, a new complete system totally new architecture that um, that will uh, make the change possible and, and Alice, just to finish, uh, you know, in kind of 30 seconds, have you got any tips for small businesses or creatives who are looking for, for successful partnerships? Again, I think that if you consider an artist as a stakeholder, it's a very good idea mm. to talk with artists because they will represent uh, the interest of the civil society but with a vision which goes, you know, uh, a very long-term vision. So I think that if you want to go far, it's good to have this view from artists and to collaborate with them. And uh, the artist has the power often. <laughs> they don't have the power. Artists don't, don't have the power. But they, they have a power in their mind, but not, society has to use this power, but they don't have the power within the society, unfortunately. Maybe things are changing, and um, hopefully with, uh, with, with artists calling out for better due diligence, we know that that, that, that can be a successful future. So anyway, thank you so much, and um, please give a round of applause to, to everybody. Def definitely be sure to um, check out all of the various initiatives as well. Um, it is, especially some of the art that um, I know that you've been involved with, it's just absolutely incredible to see. So um, it's a shame we couldn't get it on the big screen. <laughs> um, but thank you so much, everybody. Um, and we actually do have one uh, final unplanned session that is going to be happening in just a few minutes. So um, thanks for, for um, leaving the stage, guys. The final addition uh, to the program is a very exciting un unraveling of the first ever plastic forecast um, with the Mindaroo Foundation. So it's going to be happening in the next couple of minutes. Um, so thank you so much for, for listening. And I hope uh, everybody is very up for a little bit of connections and networking. Please do speak to people if you don't know them. And um, thanks for, for, for listening. <laughs>